October. October's scary. October's very, very near. If you feel fear, October scary story man. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 4, page 13. <laughs> I am your host, Rish the Reaper Outfield. And I am Big the Butcher Anklevich. And this is R-O-8-O-T, the Night Stalker. Really? Yeah. Today's October scary story is The Artist by Alex Moisey. <laughs> <laughs> Alex Moisey is a Romanian born college student living in Illinois and ignoring real life issues like angry friends and failing classes in favor of horrific scenarios and disturbing what ifs. His work has been published in various anthologies and magazines, but The Artist is his first story produced as a podcast. It is an original and previously unpublished piece that deals with souls and why one shouldn't go around stealing them. For more information about Alex Moisey or his work, please visit his blog at www.draken.co.nr. The Artist by Alex Moisey Death is a fact of life. There is nothing tragic or uplifting about it. If anything, it's shameful. But that's why I am here. I erase the grimace of horror from a corpse's face, and I offer the family a good memory instead. Sometimes I clean soiled bodies or remove embarrassing rigor mortis. Almost always, I replace the stench of fear and pain with a fine fragrance of cologne. And once in a while, when it's worth it, I remove the soul and sell it to those willing to pay enough. There's a handful of us, one or two living in every major city, soul harvesters, catering to rich junkies with eclectic tastes and low morals. Not that most of them really understand where their favorite high comes from. They choose not to ask too many questions, and we prefer to remain silent. After all, even though what we do is not illegal per se, most people would still frown upon it. Souls are a delicate subject, shrouded in misconception. Most people believe them to be nothing more than a checkbook for the afterlife, as if angels weigh it after you die. You had 44,000 sins and 66,000 good deeds. Looks like you're going to heaven. Next! It's nothing like that. A soul is just that part of you that keeps everything together. It starts as a faint glow that molds around your life and your choices, and then molds the world around you. Ever wondered why some people are always lucky, while others attract disaster? Someone once said that people make their own fate. Nothing could be closer to the truth. But all of that is not truly important. What really matters about a soul is that if it is extracted and prepared correctly, it can blow your mind away. You drink a spoonful of pure life force, and you can live ten years in one second. No hangovers, no bad trips, just a few lingering memories that belong to someone else and the experiences of a lifetime. Soul drink, the perfect drug. Ishmael, my professor, used to say this peculiar property explained the quest for meaning. Our purpose is to be God's snack food. Ishmael was full of such sayings and wisdom pellets. He reminded me of the stereotypical wise owl you see in cartoons. He had a white beard, a hooked nose, and a liking for brown suits. Even his eyes were large and blinked too fast, like daylight was too strong for him. Only his small red hat ruined the illusion. 
I sometimes wondered if he wore it in respect for his Egyptian heritage, or just so people wouldn't think he was a giant nightbird. Of course, I never told him this. I owed him too much. He was my closest teacher in med school, and the only one who listened when I told him about the blob of colored light I saw while conducting my first autopsy. He was also the one who used his connections so I would get a job right out of grad school. It's true I never considered working as an embalmer, but a job with St. James Hospital straight out of school was more than I could ever hope for. Ishmael even vouched for me so I didn't have to go through the tedious year of apprenticeship. Instead, he taught me himself in his spare time. My first day at St. James, Ishmael was there to congratulate me. He showed up at my new office with a bottle of expensive wine. We drank, and he told me of the strange properties of the human soul, explaining for the first time why I could see colored light inside a corpse's chest. I was one of the very few people gifted with seeing a thumb-sized ball of pure life force, where most only saw an ordinary piece of flesh. Ishmael himself wasn't as blessed, but in his years of teaching, I was the third student he could help develop their skill. Develop? I asked, surprised to hear my professor talking so calmly about what I had considered religious superstition. With a faint smile, he told me how much a processed soul was worth, and I gasped in surprise. My family had never been poor, but the amount was extraordinary. Supply and demand, Ishmael said. How many people do you think can see souls? And how many of those will actually have the chance to open another man's chest? I nodded absentmindedly, and he went on, telling me how to boil the bulb of light and expose it to chemical mixtures that would dissolve it into soul drink. It was a delicate process, maybe even harder than saving a man's life. If I was interested, he could lend me many books on the subject, maybe give me some more tips. He explained all of this casually, while I listened with wide eyes and a slack jaw. Before the day was over, we shook hands and settled on a date for the first delivery. One last thing, he told me before we parted ways. This is not illegal, but that doesn't mean that it's something to boast about. Very few people have such a gift like yours. But don't let it go to your head and don't act foolishly. You wouldn't be the first one to get killed by some moron who doesn't have a clue about souls in the afterlife. It was a warning Ishmael never repeated in the years to follow. And he didn't need to. I might have started in the business out of greed and a feeling of duty to my professor, but I soon found another reason. As the money in my bank account increased, I found a joy I had never expected. It wasn't about the cash I received for a well-extracted soul. It was about the job itself and the tangible rewards. I knew that at any point I could quit and never work another day. I knew I had earned this wealth with my skill, and it made me proud. Proud enough to stay after hours, carefully patching up a corpse so there would be no trace of my intrusion, or meticulously mixing chemicals for the boiling process. I was like a master artist preparing his next sculpture or painting. I knew I had a rare and valuable talent, and I was in love with it. Out of all addictions that one can afford with newfound wealth, I had become a workaholic. As for the moral dilemma, the part I had feared most after I shook hands with my professor, it never came. Seeing all the sour-faced relatives sitting in small, white-tiled rooms with cups of shitty coffee, I felt absolutely nothing. Sometimes they were poor, riding the subway so that they could identify a man involved in a gang drive-by. Sometimes they were rich, dressed in fur, and anxious to get the body to a private funeral home. But they always had the same look of fear for their own lives. As soon as they would meet me, they would look around with nervous eyes, as if I would cut them up unless they behaved. It was hard to feel bad for people who only cared for themselves. So I kept doing what I was good at, slicing dead bodies open, replacing their body fluids with formaldehyde, and taking out the small bulb of radiant light that nested near the pulmonary veins on the left side of the heart. I'd been doing this for almost five years when Ishmael didn't meet me on our usual day. Instead, he visited me at my office the next morning. I had never seen Ishmael so early before, and after his first visit, he made a point out of avoiding my office. He hated the smell of hospitals, and seeing the white walls of the morgue made him sick. 
It was one of the reasons I was the one extracting the souls, and he sold them. He hated to be around death. I was ready to joke about his being 12 hours late when I saw the nervous way he looked around, and a bad feeling overcame me. Seeing his tired eyes and the deep shadows on his face, I feared we were caught. Police or angry mobs were probably on their way to take care of us. What else could it have been? Ishmael never worried about anything. It was his job to find solutions. And just like me, he was very good at his job. This is it, boy. He smiled, chewing on an unlit cigarette. This is big time, boy. Bigger than me or you. This is it. In my office, just a few feet away from the corpses I cut open for something that should not exist, I suddenly felt uncomfortably nervous. I had always expected Ishmael to say that we were done. No one else would buy the souls. We were out of business, and I was out of a job. I feared that moment more than anything. I had grown too used to the sound of bone being cut and the sight of a fresh soul. Without that thrill of discovery, my job was just tedious routine. I had a talent for preparing souls, and quite frankly, I didn't think I could live without it. But, thank God, that was not the case. Ishmael chewed his cigarette and told me that after that night, we would walk away richer than kings or die like dogs. Tonight you will receive a girl, probably after hours, he said. You have never seen such a soul. You have never handled such purity, and, God willing, you will never have to again. She's something special and very dangerous. She belongs to the Shadow Men, and they will feast on her. Once you retrieve what we need, you will be paid ten times the usual. If you mess it up, we both die. Am I clear? Ishmael was trembling. His forehead was sweaty. There were no wise words from him that morning. How will I recognize her, I asked, as he was about to leave. You will. If nothing else, one of them will bring her here. You'll know he is a shadow when you see him. Ishmael stopped for a second and measured me with his wide eyes. Boy, I don't need to say this. I'm sure you figured out by now, but you are one of the best soul collectors I know. Maybe the best. That's why they chose you for this task. You have a gift, and tonight you can let your talent shine. If you do well, this will be your masterpiece. With those last words, Ishmael left me alone in my office to wonder who or what the shadow men were and who this girl was, and most of all, wondering what he meant when he said masterpiece. Over the years, I had handled hundreds of souls, maybe thousands. I couldn't keep any records, but I remembered the special ones— a transsexual prostitute pierced by a dozen bullets, an old woman without any name, and once, when a client requested it, a golden retriever. There were about a dozen unique ones, each displaying a brilliant color or an unusual size. The more special the soul, the harder it was to extract. Sometimes I had to cut my way through the heart to reach the bulb of light, or carefully saw through the ribs. If a scalpel touched a soul, or I was too rough, it would burst open and be lost forever. During my first year, this would happen with every other patient. Gone to heaven, along with our paycheck, Ishmael would sigh. He was just joking, but I often wondered what became of the souls that were never recovered. Could they rot away, or, or did they linger in their host's meatless ribcages? When I asked him, Ishmael shrugged and told me to focus on the task at hand. I wasn't paid to ask questions. I was paid to collect souls and then process them. The final preparation involved boiling or washing the soul in different chemicals according to color and size. It was a delicate process, and I had many successes I was proud to remember. But a masterpiece? What could I deem as a masterpiece? There was always a soul harder to collect, or, or more delicate and sensitive to light or handling. A masterpiece was the absolute, the best I could do. Nothing could be as perfect as a masterpiece. I could barely focus on my daily tasks, checking the clock every few minutes. I was nervous and curious. I was eager to start working on this new challenge. The fact that my life might be at stake crossed my mind once or twice, but I pushed it aside. I was ready for anything. I was the best, a master ready to begin on his ultimate work. It was 9.30, and I was finishing the embalming of a murder victim when time stood still. It was a strange feeling, as if I was in a dream. I was certain that if I let go of the bone saw in my hand, it would float in front of me, all the rules that I knew broken by a stronger force. 
If I moved, it would be painfully slow, like drifting in a pool of gelatin. Before I could test my theory, the main door to the morgue swung open. A wave of pain flashed through my head like brain freeze, and any illusion that this was just a dream dissolved. A tall man in a long black coat entered the room. His face was hidden by a black fedora, his hands covered by leather gloves. Behind him, like a peculiar cape, shadows slipped and twisted, dancing in a strange and mesmerizing way. Or did they? I tried to focus my eyes on him, on the strange tendrils of darkness floating in the air, on his face. I couldn't. It was as if my brain refused to accept his existence. Pain slashed through my mind once more, reminding me my job was not about asking questions. He spoke, and his voice floated towards my ears, his words coiling around me like a snake ready to strike. The smell of dead leaves rotting in piles filled the room. Your friend vouches for you. You have until one in the morning. Do not disappoint us. He was gone. I blinked and he disappeared. My watch showed ten o'clock. Thirty minutes had passed in what seemed like a second. Ishmael had good reason to be scared. He was toying with something much bigger than us in our small clandestine operation. Yet somehow, this didn't seem to matter. I was too anxious to see the new corpse. The covered table stood by the entryway where the dark man had spoken to me just a second ago. My hands were trembling as I wheeled her in. Without replacing my blood-soiled scrubs, I lifted the white covers and I fell in love. She was perfect. Every muscle in her body flowed as if she was a drawing of the ideal physique. Her skin was white and smooth to the touch, her half-open eyes the color of sparkling emeralds, her hair brown curls. I had seen many women in my life, but none so perfect, so beautiful. She was the ideal woman, Madonna incarnated before my eyes. A sense of peace fell over me, a clarity that I had never felt before. I usually spent at least an hour prodding the corpse and figuring the best way to cut, to reach the core. Now, everything was clear. Everything was so simple. This was indeed going to be my masterpiece. The thought that I was about to dissect an angel crossed my mind briefly. But it was not my job to ask questions, so I pushed those worries away and reached for my scalpel. I made the usual why, cutting above her perfectly round breasts. Quickly, I wiped away the few pearls of blood and cut deeper. I could feel the sharp blade slice through skin and fat into the layer of muscle underneath. I never felt the scalpel slide so easily, the cut deep and precise without even trying. I was the blade, navigating my way through tissue in a perfectly geometrical pattern. It was divine. Her skin unfolded itself upon the lightest touch, like the bloody petals of a strange flower. Underneath, muscle, bone, everything was ordered like a diagram. I sliced through the pectoral muscle, and within minutes, I was sawing through her sternum. The smell of bone filled the air, and I realized I had forgotten my mask. Somehow, I feared that stopping, leaving her alone, even for a moment, would be a mistake. So I continued breathing the burning smell. I loved every second of it. I lost myself in the buzz, and a wide smile spread on my blood-splattered face. I was nearly finished, and I could already see the blinding light sparkling through her ribs through the crack I had made. I could not help a short giggle as I pried her open, expecting to see the familiar glow hidden by the heart. But she was full of surprises, this one. There was nothing inside her chest, no lungs, no heart, nothing but a blinding light shining in a dozen colors like an indecisive rainbow. I shielded my eyes, laughing to myself. She was nothing but a vessel for her soul. No biology here, just divine creation. Carefully, I examined the soul. It was slightly larger than my fist, a miniature disco ball of colors. Slowly, I pulled it free from the tissue that held it in place. I cut once or twice. I stopped at least a dozen times. By now, the clock was racing against me, but I could not afford to be careless. This was the single most important moment of my life, my masterpiece. Removing the bulb of light from her chest, I considered what chemicals I should use to boil it. Any acid was usually too powerful for a light red, but then the soul in my hands changed to a deep blue. A base then? Again, the soul shifted, turning a bright yellow that burned my eyes. It was a challenge indeed. I placed the bright, pulsating light on a sterile tablet and watched it change colors every few seconds. It was fascinating, larger than any soul I had seen. 
Handling it was like touching a burning piece of ice. My gloves were perforated and my skin charred where I had touched it. But all of that didn't matter. I was still able to handle the boiling vat so I could process it. A single sip of the final result, if well prepared, would have been more powerful than anything I had ever created. Ishmael had been right. This would be my best work. All other jobs had been just training for this single creation, a perfect drink for the gods themselves. Suddenly, my mind stopped in mid-thought. Where I had touched it, the glow of the soul was stronger and sparkling, almost liquid. I glanced at my burnt hands. A fine cover of blood was spread over my raw fingertips. Of course, a metal-based solution with proteins, glucose, and carbon dioxide. It was a combination of almost all the chemicals I could use. Without a second of hesitation, I grabbed my scalpel and raised my left arm. The skin on the back of my hand split open with surprising ease, and blood poured from my dissected vein. Carefully, I washed the soul with the flow of my own life force, mesmerized by the chemical reaction. I had never seen anything like it before. Wherever my blood touched it, the glowing bulb would turn liquid, shimmering like mercury. Yet it kept its form, a perfect ball of pure life. I spent the next hours carefully prodding my veins and wondering how much blood I could lose before I fainted. It didn't really matter. This was my masterpiece. Dying for it felt strangely right. What was I to become once it was done? How could I return to the thumb-sized souls that barely shine in one color? Looking at the bulb of light, drying and solidifying into one round living stone, I felt empty and pointless. By the time I pressed on my open wound, stopping the blood flow, my eyes were blurry and my throat hurt. I was done. In front of me stood a perfectly round ball that was once the strongest soul I had ever seen. There was not one single imperfection. My extraction was flawless and my processing technique impeccable. I would never face such a challenge again. I was done. I was out of a job. Pain rushed through my mind like an icicle piercing my brain. For a second, I found myself outside my own body. I saw them entering the lobby. There were at least four, each dressed in the same long black coat. The receptionists stared at them with blind eyes, and they just walked past. Were they usual visitors of St. James Hospital? Or did we fear them so much our mind just erased their presence? It didn't matter. They could sense it was done, but also that something was wrong. I had doubts, and they were ready to erase them. It was a glimpse, and I was inside my own head once more. I briefly considered running away or locking the doors, barricading myself in. It was stupid. There was no escape from their eyes. They were shadows. I was nothing. Not anymore. Ishmael opened the door, and two of them followed, dark tendrils probing the air. Marvelous work, my professor said, lying eyes on the round soul. I knew you could do it, and you will be rewarded handsomely. Twenty times the usual because you worked so fast. I could feel the greedy glares shot towards the solid stone next to me. I could sense how hungry they were, how anxious to start their feast. For a second, I thought about something smart to say. Maybe that it wasn't about money, that it was an art. But all it came down to was that I was an addict as much as those dark creatures twirling their tentacles towards me. I needed the sound of the bone saw and the challenge of soul harvesting. It was all I had, and they had taken it away from me. They had taken away my life, and now they were going to claim my masterpiece, the one work that I had poured myself into. I couldn't let them lay their dirty claws on my precious, my beautiful creation. With one swing, I pushed the soul toward the stone floor. It fell forever. I stared at Ishmael's betrayed face, at the horrors trying to reach it in time. Hours flew by. My masterpiece smashed into a thousand pieces of light each a different shade of color. It was a rainbow of feelings, emotions, and memories, filling the room with a strange warmth. For a second, I had forgotten about the world, and I basked in an ocean of light. Then it was all over. Before I could move, the soul was gone, dissolved and lost forever. I embraced the pain and darkness that followed.
Author's note. Being raised as an Orthodox Christian, I have always been fascinated with the concept of the human soul. Countless divine as well as real wars have been waged in order to save souls or corrupt them. Yet there is no way to truly quantify or observe this mysterious life force, at least as far as we know. My imagination, always a bit prone to conspiracy theories, offered me the ideal solution to this dilemma. Souls were very real, tangible objects, but this truth was hidden from most people on purpose. The idea of a worldwide secret network of illegal soul harvesters catering to a few scrupulous rich was the next step. Add a mysterious and soul-hungry group of strange shadow men, and you have the basic recipe for the artist. However, as it often happens, while I was writing it, I realized the story was not really about what it first seemed, namely religion or strange conspiracies. But the core of the artist is a simple man who gradually discovers what his talent is and grows to realize that he cannot live without his art, even if what he is doing is morally questionable and even dangerous. Okay, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the story. Thank you, Alex, for submitting that last of the October scary story. I'm still doing this slightly scary voice. For <laughs> thanks, that, that that was the last of the October scary stories for this year. Yeah, it's it's sad to see them go. Very last of our little children. Goodbye, Alex. Right often. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed the October scary story event for 2008 slash ooh, slasher 2009 and i think it went over well what do you think well i'm really happy with the stories that we got and uh, as i said a couple episodes ago if we're still around october of this year i'm more than willing to do another october scary story event i love horror stories and i think that there are a lot of talented writers out there a lot of different ways to scare a person yeah uh, this this story is totally different than the other three Definitely. And thank you, Alex, for submitting it. Also, that reminds me, we've got a broken mirror event going on right now. Right now as we speak. I bet you right now there's a writer tap, tap, tapping away on his keyboard, trying to keep up with the pace that you must maintain to get a great story done in a month. You think you could write a story in a month? I think I can. Yeah, I've done it before. Okay, I actually, you think you could write a story in a week? I, I have actually written a story in a week once. Okay, let's say that I needed a story 48 hours from now. Could you do it? If, and it was a weekend. Yeah, if it was a weekend, I could probably do it. If I had the idea and stuff like that already ready to go, if I had to come up with everything all together, I don't know. That might be difficult. Okay, it's a Saturday morning. You get a telephone call and somebody says, we've got Morgan Freeman. We've got him tied <laughs> to a chair. We will kill Morgan Freeman if you don't have a story within 24 hours. I think I could... Does it have to be a good story? <laughs> well, it has to have beginning, middle, and end. And it has to be the best My you best can do. Effort. I could give it the college try. I could. I think I can 24 hours if I had, you know, the full time to, to do it. Please, Big. This is Morgan Freeman. <laughs> do your best. Uh, that's, that's the I'd old... I'd say up. it was fair to say I liked Big Anklovich from the beginning. I shall do my best. Do you remember when Ben Stein would say that every time he would go into the booth or whatever the heck that was from remember, that show? We were talking last week about audience work. I sat in the audience for when Ben Stein's really? movie. And that was really, really funny because Jimmy Kimmel was funny as all get out. <laughs> and uh, and Stein was actually quite funny, but uh -huh. I mean, it would just be... In a different way. It would be fun to see if I knew the answers. and say, I don't know. I did a few game shows and most of the time they were not fun, but that one was. I like to watch that show. That was a good show. I always thought it was funny when Ben Stein would go in there. He's like, I shall do my best. I don't know if I'll be able, you know, he, he always downplayed it and then he'd go in there and freaking nail every single question. Like, and you're just like, do you it. have to get two out of seven. Uh, I, 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 yeah. I'll do my best. Yeah, he would always say that. It's just like, dude, you're going to get seven out of seven, you weird. <laughs> What would Alex Moisey say, huh? Oh, forget. Edit this out. So let's just get it right out of the way right now. Broken Mirror event going on during the month of April. That's right. We've given a premise, and anyone who would like to participate can write a story, a short story, on the premise. Someone arrives in town and discovers that everyone there is exactly the same. <laughs> sorry we already did that <laughs> it doesn't have to be a scary story it can be scary it can be a fantasy story it can comedy. be funny it can be it can be dirty <laughs> well can it be dirty it might lower your chances because i mean how many dirty stories have we done on the podcast well so do your far? sisters still listen to the podcast my sister's children listen to the podcast oh, no. unfortunately 
the guidelines for the Broken Mirror event and any story that you might want to submit are on the website at www.doonsteef.com. Read through those if you'd like. And when, when and if you send us a broken mirror story, mention that that's what it is in the subject line. Mention that it's a broken mirror. Or you can put BMSE right there in the subject line uh, and send it to us. You have until April 30th. That's right. Yeah, write that story within that time period. You have one month to complete the story. Or Morgan Freeman will die. <laughs> Wait, oh, I can't I say love that. Morgan you're gonna Freeman. get brought. You're, you're gonna have the cops at the door here. Yeah, so get right and get working. Type. What are you doing? Not typing. They're listening to the podcast. Oh, at that's least, right. Listen to the listen podcast. Listen to the end. Some poor unloved soul worked hard on editing this, and uh, you very should get... unloved soul. I know. It just. Do you think it helps me in the social arena that I mentioned that I hugged Richard Simmons? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. No, girls like jerks, man. That's not, that's not gonna help. But guys, mm -hmm. you know, I'm getting less and less picky with each passing year. If you enjoyed the story, uh, also feel free to hop on our blog site and leave a comment. You can leave a comment on Facebook. We do have the ability to do that. So big people can go to doingsteve.com and download each episode that way. That's how I get it. Uh -huh. But how does the iTunes thing? Well, the way I do it is I subscribe to the podcast. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or on other, I think there's other pod catchers out there. Cow catchers. I don't know what they're called. I just use iTunes. But anyways, you can subscribe there and then you get like the the feed and, and you have all your podcasts all lined up and then you just download them from there. And in the iTunes store, there's a page for every podcast and you can go on there and you can rate the podcast. You can say, I give it five stars or one star. And uh, that would be one, one way that you could contribute. You know, we beg people to donate every week, but another way you could help us is by recommending us to those out there who are looking for a good story podcast. And heck, you don't have to do it on iTunes. You, you can send people an email. You can send a mass email out to all your contacts in your email address. Although they probably figure it was spam and delete it if you did that. Or if you love us so much that telling your friends is not enough, what do you think they could do? They could sleep with me. That's asking one heck of a lot. Won't cost them a dime. <laughs> Or if you value your sanity more than your money, you could just donate to the show. That's what I was getting at. Donate. Jeez. You know, we pay our authors, and we have to have money to pay them with. So please donate to the show. That's right. <laughs> this story, you know, a, a, a horror story, I suppose. But to me, it felt almost more like one of those noir films. Did I pronounce that correctly? I think it's noir you were close, but not quite. I'm sticking by my pronunciation. Okay, you go ahead. For some reason, in reading it, I pictured the shady dudes with fedoras and trench coats <laughs> and everything in black and white. And yeah. I don't know why. It never said it was set in the 30s or anything like that, right? <laughs> no, I don't think it was supposed to be. It was really interesting. And uh, a special thanks uh, to Josh Roseman, who actually edited the story for us. I think he did a great job with it. I really enjoy the music that he picked out for it. Oh, yeah. That, that music was so cool. That Look, if we didn't already have a great main <laughs> theme to the October Scary Story, mm -hmm. thing, I would want that to be our theme. I, I, I may even want it to be our theme anyway. Well, who is that? What? It's funny you should ask, because we do have to attribute the artist on this. Uh, the song was Relive, and the band is Moon Prototype. And there will be a link on the show notes that you can go and check out their album. They have several songs that you can uh, listen to. And yeah, it's Creative Commons. You gotta love that. Yeah, that was good stuff. Thank you, Josh. You're the man. So back to the Broken Mirror event. Uh, how's your uh, story coming along, Rish? Honestly, I I don't know what I'm going to do with it. Um, uh, as you know, I'm one of those people that waits till the last minute. I sort of thrive on deadlines. Yes, I'm hoping to start it around the 27th, 28th. Oh, maybe. that's a good plan. You know Morgan Freeman. Oh, I love Morgan Freeman. He's his life doesn't hang in the balance or anything, does it? <laughs> I mean, it's a good thing that you could probably get a story done in 24 hours. Because, anyways. I tend to thrive a little on deadlines, too. And it seems like something has to get me going because... Well, tell me, I know that you've written a lot of stories, way more than I've written. 
you must have some kind of a method or something that you use to write stuff. How do you work? Not very often. <laughs> well, that I know, but I mean, when you're writing. No, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't have a good method. Otherwise, I would be a much more prolific writer. I, I have to me, you are. <laughs> Well, yeah, and compared to a lot of people, I am. But most of the people that submit these stories have had them published or have, you know, so-and-so has been writing since October 2005. He's been published in... And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> but it seems like there are some people out there who really are able to focus. And they're able to force themselves to just sit and write until it's done. Or maybe they're able to set aside X number of hours in a week or a day and write during that time and not play solitaire or not sleep. There's so many things to distract me. There was one time I drove down to Oceanside, California for a weekend by myself. Well, obviously by myself. <laughs> and it was just like, okay, there's no TV. There's no video games. There's, there's no computer. There's no internet. That's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to write this whole weekend. And yeah, I probably wrote for a half an hour in the 40 hours I was there. Some people have discipline. I don't. It's hard to come by. It's something I guess you got to work at. There was a time in my lame writing career where I... How many stories did I put out? What did you say? Like four? Before we started this you podcast, know, I'd say you had four stories done by like May or June. Yeah, which is way... I mean, that's like doubling my total or something. I mean, seriously, I... I how did I manage that? Well, one of the things that we were doing was uh, we were putting pressure on each other to write. I was coming over every single week, kind of like we do now. Mm -hmm. Sunday night was the night that I came over. We would watch Battlestar Galactica, or, we, or I would bring a DVD, and we'd talk about writing every single week, and we started to set goals, and part of it was just I expected you to write, and you expected me to write, and we knew that the next week the question would be asked, well, did you? And I don't know, maybe we had more integrity then, because now it's like, well, did you? And I have no shame in saying, no, nah, I didn't. I, I, I pooped in the bed one night. <laughs> you have no shame in saying that. <laughs> that. That could be a topic of conversation. In fact, let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah. Not me pooping in the bed, but okay, a guy emailed me. He had submitted a story and we, we rejected it. But it was one of those, that, like what I was talking about the other week, where there was the seed of an awesome story in there. And it just wasn't developed. It, he was a quarter of the way there, or maybe half. Thing. But he emailed mm -hmm. me and he said, well, what are some of your suggestions of how I can be a better writer? Maybe any books that would help him with his craft. So I thought, let's just talk about that right now, if we don't okay. mind. Are there any books? Do you like books? Uh, this is going to sound vain, but no. I, th I can think of one book that was helpful to me. And it was Orson Scott Card's uh, How to Write Fantasy and Science Fiction. Oh, cool. I have to agree with you there. That and was one I would mention. It just in that he, he talked about world building and how to create aliens, how to create interesting characters, how to create conflict, things to avoid. But yeah, to be honest, most of the time I read a book about how to write or how to make a compelling story or whatever it is. And I'll be three chapters in and think, you know, I know all of this stuff. I know that you want like a snappy first sentence, or I know that you want to not repeat the same word again and again. The and night again. was sultry. And lots of times I'll put the book down and think, why am I wasting my time reading this when I could just be writing a story? And I know not a lot of people feel that way. So what, well, what is your experience? I'm willing to bet that you've taken writing classes before, right? Oh, yeah, sure. See, the closest thing to a writing class I took was uh, our screenwriting class that you and I took together. And but instead of taking all these writing courses, you chose to take courses in things that you would actually be paid to do in the future. <laughs> yeah, the square dancing class did land me a job later, so that was good. So, you know, I've never been to one of those classes, and I, I sometimes have felt like, gosh, if I just had time, I would go to the local community college or whatever and take a, a, a writing class. So, you know, I don't know these things, and so the books have been helpful to me. And, and Orson Scott Card's How to Write Science Fiction and Fantasy, I bought that. I even got him to sign that book for me once. And he said, oh, are you a writer? Well, good luck. And, Next. And, yeah, pretty much. But a lot of times these books aren't necessarily so much instructional, too, as they can just be inspirational. 
And I found Stephen King's on writing to be that. Mm. He'd just talk about stuff. And then I remember, I think in the book, he mentions you're a writer if you do it every day. I mean, you are what you do every day. So if you're a writer, you need to write every day. So apparently I'm a wanker. <laughs> There's not a lot of things worthwhile that I do every day. I mean, obviously, you got to eat every day. You know, I mentioned that book to the guy in the email. I also mentioned a story by Robert McKee. Uh, but I think that's much more about screenwriting. Uh -huh. um, but boy, dude, I was so disappointed by on writing. I, I so looked forward to that book and I thought it was all going to be on what it is like it the wasn't. last 30 pages, but most of it is an autobiography, yeah. and which is fine, but That's... I just wish he had split it and written an autobiography and written on writing Yeah, because that stuff at the very end where he shows the first draft of his story, dude, that was priceless, man. Where you could see the story and then see where it went. And, and he annotates like three pages. And those three pages was more useful than anything else that he put in there. Because I just, I know how to write, but taking something that I've written and making it really good was what I wanted to see. Uh -huh. Because you can't teach somebody how to come up with a good idea. No. And you can't teach somebody how to uh, make your character interesting or make your dialogue funny. I mean, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or make a, a situation scary or make some action exciting. That's not something you can teach that just happens by work or by talent or by repetition. Right. But taking something and saying, this doesn't quite work. This is what I would do to make it better. Dude, that, that was so instructionable and so informative. That's not even a word. And he didn't even do it with the whole bloody story. He just did it with three or four pages of the story. And it's just one of those where it's like, oh, if you hadn't been killed in that accident in 99, I would kill you. I, I'd have to agree. And in that book, I found it to be more inspirational than instructional so much. But there are books out there that can give you a lot of pointers, like, you know, show things, don't tell them, stuff like that. You know, once you read these books, then the next time you sit down to write, you, you can try and watch out for when you're breaking these rules that you're supposed to be uh, following. And so hopefully you can become a better writer that way. So I don't think books are, are useless, but when it comes down to it, I think much more improvement will happen in your writing if you write more. So your whole complaint that you have, what are you doing sitting here reading this book instead of writing, is valid. You know, the, the more you write, the better you will get. And like they say, practice makes perfect. And, you know, you're going to become a better soccer player the more you get out there with a the ball and kick it around. And you're going to become a better writer the more you sit down and actually write. And a lot of you write when you're first learning how is just going to be crap. And it's going to be stuff that you're going to have to throw away. Or five years down the line, you can rewrite it and fix it and make it better if you really think it's a great story, but you got to put the time in. I'm even more at fault than you are, I think, on that. Because, you know, I don't have a lot of the obligations or the distractions that you have. And yet, where are my stories? Where is my broken mirror story? Where, Dude, I was going to write this story for a friend of mine for Christmas. Because I, I sure as hell wasn't going to spend money on him. <laughs> but we had talked about this story in 1991. And I thought, holy cow, I never wrote that. I'm going to write that and I'm going to give that to him for Christmas. And here it is mid-April and I still haven't finished it. I have all sorts of ideas that have just, I, it's like I have a drawer in my head and I just keep sticking ideas in there. And the drawer has got to be full to bursting with crap that I should have written a long time ago. And I just never put the time into it. But last year, before we started the podcast, I wrote more stories than I had written in all the rest of my life, probably. And the one thing that I think that was actually working for me was I said, okay, I'm going to use this particular time that I have to write. And I actually stuck to that for a while. So, you know, they say you're a writer if you write every day. And I think Stephen King in his book says he wrote every day except 4th of July, Christmas, and his birthday or something like that. Who knows if that's true or not, but, you know, it's a good thing to well, motivate you with. The guy puts out two novels a year, at least he used to. <laughs> yeah, so and his novels are gazillion pages long, too. So I would be surprised if he didn't do that. I think that's probably the difference. You know, if, if Rish and I had the discipline, and I, well, I'll say this, because I'm not going to toot my own horn, but I think Rish is a fine writer. And if Rish had the discipline to sit down and write every single day for an hour, except for Christmas and 4th of July and his birthday, I would say within five years, 
you would be seeing actual novels on the shelf by Rish Outfield. I, well, if Rish would do that and would also submit his stories somewhere. To be a writer is one thing, but to become a published writer is another thing because you got to have the balls to lay it on the line and say, hey, here's my story. Reject it. I dare you. And that's hard. You know, you got to go through that rejection if you want to get anywhere. If you ever want to win the Bram Stoker Award, you know you're going to be rejected at least a thousand times probably before you get there. It's hard to take. It's like asking a girl out. Yeah, something that I quite mastered. <laughs> what Rish needs is an agent that will do all that stuff for him. Okay, well, 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 well instead of depressing me. <laughs> Was that depressing you? Well, Come on, I praised you. I any, said you were great. Any excuse to feel sorry for myself. But uh, I was going to say, uh, let's focus on things that, that have helped you. Okay, so the time when you were most prolific, you were setting aside time to write. Were there any other factors that helped you? Well, we also, like you were talking about earlier, we would get together once a week and we would talk about how we were doing on whatever story we were writing on. You know, once we got close to the end, we'd be like, okay, next time we get together, you got to be done and we're going to swap these stories and we're going to read them and, you know, give each other our, our comments. I looked forward to that because your comments were always very useful and helpful. And it's just cool to have somebody else read your story and you get their reaction and stuff. So I would strive to be done in time for that. Yeah, it's definitely sharing it with somebody else helps me. And also, I keep in mind that somebody is going to be reading this. So maybe I try to be more clever or I try to be funnier or I... Okay, when I was a teenager and I first started writing, I had a best friend and he always wanted to read anything that I wrote. And so I would write, then invite him over or whatever, and he would read it. And if he laughed at something that he was supposed to laugh at, I was like, hey, I succeeded. A little triumph kind of thing. That's really, really helpful. A lot of times I'm too close to my own work. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and we'll notice that with lots of people, whether it's a, a novelist who's adapting his work to a screenplay or it's just somebody who's going to do another draft. They can't really see where it's weak or where it's confusing or where it goes on too long. I don't know. Lots of times, even whether it's typos, because yeah. my mind fills in the correct interpretation of the words and yeah, stuff. So it's read right past them. It's always good to have somebody who will read it for you who'll say, uh, did you mean to say this? Or I, I don't get that. Or, or you called him Henry and now he's Harry. You know, sometimes you don't know somebody that's a writer or somebody that would be willing to read it and mark it up and say, this is wrong. This is wrong. You need to do this here. Or this was good. You know, it's also helpful to have that, to know when they laughed or when they enjoyed it or something. But we all know all about the interwebs and all that. There's a whole bunch of resources out there. You can get together with other writers without having to go to their house. There's several uh, kinds of online writers groups. And I would suggest if you're a writer to get involved with one of those. I've heard of one called Critters, which I've considered a lot of actually joining up in this. And it's just a critiquing group where you get in there, you critique other people's stories, they critique your stories, and they just get better that way. It's one of those things that really helps your story is getting people's feedback on it. And they can help you fix problems like grammar that's messed up or typos that are in there or just things that before you're sending it off and i mean this is something that we've noticed as editors here at the dune steve we get a lot of stories and we know that they could be good stories and maybe they even are good stories but they still have a ton of typos or a ton of grammar errors in there and at a certain point, even though it's a good story, you're just like, okay, this is not going to make it. This needs another draft or it needs another couple of drafts. And I, I would say, and I don't know if that bugs you as much as it bugs me, but that may be the number one reason why stories that are sent to us don't get accepted is because they just need a draft or two more because there's too many errors in them. Yeah, definitely. That's my main criticism. It, you know, a story is almost there or in some cases not even close to there, but you can see where it wants to go. Yeah, I think spell checking has made a lot of people really lazy. That's not meant to be offensive, but if you write T-H-E-R-E -E and you mean T-H-E-Y apostrophe R-E, -E, your spell check's not going to catch that. Yeah. But another person probably will. I don't know. There's so many people that don't even know which there is supposed to go in. Okay, but, but if, yeah, if people... you've got a friend that doesn't know that, then maybe that's not <laughs> that's the person not the that you want to be helping you do a second draft. 
I'm, I'm fighting the inclination to sound pompous here, but again, we are the editors. I've got to be a little bit pompous or at least come from a position of, hey, this is what's good and this is what's not so good. Yeah, I don't think I'm saying anything offensive, but please, before you send us a story or before you send it anywhere, share it with somebody who knows what they're doing or knows the English language. I, I used to do that with all of my friends that were writers. I had no problem taking their work, a screenplay or a short story or whatever it is, and circle the things with question marks or what suggestions or words that I don't think quite work or phrases. And I love it when people do it with my stuff. You just wrote a story last week. I think it went with a contest. And yeah, you were just sending me out the drafts. And as we were IMing back and forth on AIM, I got in there and I'm just saying, oh, you missed this word in this sentence that you need to put in. And oh, there's this typo. And oh, this sentence doesn't quite make sense. And see right there, there's three problems that the judges or editors yeah. or whatever it would have been would have seen. And who knows how many problems they allow before it's like, you know what? No, we reject. With me, again, I'm going to sound pompous. If I see IT apostrophe S and it's supposed to be <laughs> ITS, like more than once, I'm already going, oh, geez. And I'll start to look for other problems. <laughs> if that makes me an a-hole, I'm sorry, but I'm sure I'm not alone in that. It's just the English language is real important yeah. to me. And, you know, somebody saying suddenly he felt that he had a sudden inclination to, to suddenly run away. I just want to circle those and say, omit all but one of these uses of that word. Yeah. And yeah, that's pretty plain, though. <laughs> right? Well, I mean, maybe that was a bad example. No, but. that's a good example. And, and another thing, and this is something that Stephen King mentioned in his book, one of the ways that he works is that he will write something and then he will put it in a drawer to let it mellow and he won't look at it he won't touch it for months and then after a sufficient time has passed he will pull that back out and he's now got distance from it so he can look at that story and his mind won't automatically correct the typos because he won't remember exactly what it was that that sentence was supposed to say already dude i'm glad that you thought of it because another thing that has really helped me and i know it's helped you is reading the story aloud or yeah. more helpful having someone else read the story aloud. Which is what we did when we would get together uh, last year. We would swap the stories and then we would read them aloud to each other. And you know what? If you don't have somebody that you can do that with, and I understand there have been lots of times when I haven't had a roommate or my roommate's an a <laughs> or whatever it is, if you've got a microphone or a little mini tape recorder or even MP3 players will do it now, record your story and then again, like Stephen King said, put it away for a while. Or when you go for a drive or when you're doing something else, listen to yourself read the story. Because in just like two or three months, when I get a tiny bit of distance, I can hear things where I'm like, oh, you know, that sentence didn't work. Or, oh, I, I remembered writing something else about the house and it's not there. I got to do another draft and add something about the house. To me, that's really, really helpful. And the synapses of your brain change enough to where you're at a different place when you hear it the next time or you read it the next time. I've done that with my wife. I don't write mysteries, so she can't be bothered to read the stories that I write. But one time I forced her to sit down and I actually read the story that I wrote aloud to her. And holy cow, did that help a lot? Because if you can't manage to say Say the sentence that you've written, then obviously there's a problem with it. You go to try and say the sentence, and you're like, gosh, that doesn't make any sense. And you realize, oh, I need to add this word, or, you know, your grammar is messed up somehow. Then mark that spot in your story and go back and fix it. You know, reading aloud is a, is a huge help. And on top of that, it can also help you see that, oh, wow, that doesn't sound right. That's not what somebody would say. Yeah, lots of times, because we write silently, our minds are perfectly fine with using the word center. But when you say it out loud, you realize it should be middle. There are so many things that written work fine, but read aloud don't work, especially with dialogue. And I, I know you have it, but I had a friend who had a screenwriting program. And when you'd write a script, it would read the dialogue aloud. And depending on what color you put the dialogue in, it would do a male voice or a female voice kind of thing. Wow. And I just remember, thinking, oh, dude, can we open something I wrote and listen to it that way? And it was just so cool to hear these droids talking. <laughs> I mean, if R080T could do that, maybe I would want to have him around instead of... Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's the finger I'm giving you, man. Uh -oh. <laughs> Hey, watch your mouth, Oedo T. Jeez. Don't even care. Anyways, go on. The, the screenwriting robot was so much more useful than you are. <laughs>
Luckily, we don't have to bleep his bleeps. Well, you know what? We've been talking for a long, long time, and we could probably talk about writing once a month or once every three episodes or something like that, because it's something I'm passionate about. It's something we're trying to get better at all the time. And yeah, it's something that we have a new perspective on because we're editors now. We'll just bring this little conversation to a halt and uh, encourage anybody out there to continue writing if, if you're writers. On the message boards, if there is a book or a website or just anything, a suggestion that has helped you be a better writer, share that with other people. Because when I was 17 and I first started writing seriously, if somebody had told me, record your stories out loud so that you can hear what's wrong with them, that would have helped me tremendously. So I'm sure there are things out there that I don't know. I'm sure there's plenty that we haven't mentioned that would really help somebody out. So head over to the website and leave a comment. What helps you write? All right. So that's our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you listened all the way through. I hope you got something useful out of it. To finish it off, I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm the very angry Rish Outfield. We cut all of that out, but I did use the F word. So I'm Big Anklevich. I'm still the very angry Rich Hatfield. Why are you so angry? Well, now it's over, and I'm dead, and I haven't done anything that I want. Or I'm still alive, and there's nothing I want to do. Oh, that's not really better, is it? Well, good night, folks. I'm sorry, man. What's your deal is? Why are you so angry? It was a tool. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Take two. We had this friend in Sacramento that was into watching... Foreign flicks. Yeah, just the shows that you don't see very often. So we watched Eat, Drink, Man, Woman with him. And we also watched, uh, I think it's called Shall We Dance, the uh, Japanese version. I know you don't approve, so I will stop speaking of foreign films. Catherine Deneuve, Ursula Andres, and Charo Twice. No, 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 that's foreign flicks, Mr. Connery. Flicks.